يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد اخوتي في الله اعلم ان خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار ثم اما بعد اخوتي في الله قال الله تعالى ان الله لا يغير ما بقوم حتى يغير ما بانفسهم الله سبحانه وتعالى اشترى ان القران that he will not change the condition of people until they change their own condition what does that mean it means the change has to come from us the desire has to come from us no english ready and then when that happens and when it comes from us then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow the people to change and the condition of people to change but if we just stay under the same circumstance not willing to change not allowing to change then the condition of the ummah will not change that's why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yaqul لتأكيد إن الله لا يغير ما بقوم حتى يغير ما بأنفسهم لا بد من التغيير. The change has to come from us. Then you may say, by the sign, you and the speakers before you, you and the khatibs before you, keep saying the change must occur and the change must take place. But how can the change take place in our lives? First, you have to understand ya ikhwati fi Allah that there is something called sunnah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that you must do the asbab for Allah to allow the change to take place. Now listen to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was making hijrah he had a dream and he was told by Allah through the dream that he will make a journey and he would make hijrah to the city of Medina he was certain that he would make this journey But at the same time what did he ask Abu Bakr? He asked him to buy and purchase two camels. He asked him to find a guide that would guide them to the city of Medina. He asked Ali radiyallahu an to sleep on his bed. He asked Asma radiyallahu anha to deliver the food to them in the mountain. And he asked Abdul Rahman bin Abu Bakr to bring the sheep so he can wipe the imprint of Asma. All of this 
knowing that sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will make, will make it to the city of Medina. Then why is he doing all this? To teach us that we need to take the asbab of anything if we want any change. If you want a job, you got to apply for the job. And therefore, you will earn income. If you want to change in our life the conditions of the Muslims, then we have to learn how to change ourselves. And the first step, ikhwati fillah, of the steps of change is for us to be independent. You know what independence means? It means you should not rely on anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It means that you should put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not international nations, not international governments, not this state or that state, but on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because regardless of what you try to do, they will never be out there for your own benefit. And they will never be happy with you until you became a follower. Until you became a follower. Not become like them. لِأَنَّ اللَّهَ يَقُولُ وَلَن تَرْضَ عَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَن نَصَارَ حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتَهُمْ حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتَهُمْ Allah said, they will not be pleased with you, O Muhammad. They will not be pleased with you, O Muslims, until you follow their footsteps. But listen to the word that Allah used. He used the word taba'a. Tattabi'a millatahum. What does it mean? It means that you will never be peers. You will never be compatible. You will never be equal in their sight. You always have to follow. Because when Yusuf Musa alayhi salatu was salam wanted to follow al khid what did he say? قَالَ هَلْ أَتَّبِعُكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُعَلِّمَنِي مِمَّا عُلِّمْتَ مُجْدَعًا He said, shall I be your taba'a? And what does a taba'a do? They take the shoe of the person that they follow. They cook for the person that they follow. They serve the person that they follow. And this is what tabah means. And the only time these people would be happy with us is the day that we become tabah, servants of theirs. Anyone other than Muslims always wants you to be a follower. <coughs> and Sadaqa Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Let us tabaanna sanana man kana qablakum. He said, You will follow the footsteps of people before you. People before you. And he said, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, step by step, hand span by hand span, to the point that if they enter a loser hole, you will enter after them. The Sahaba said of Messenger of Allah. Al Yahud wa Nasara? Are you referring to the Yahud and the Nasara? He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who else? Who else? <coughs> this is the reality of the Ummah. And look at the example. Look at the example of us following others. In Dubai, subhanallah, they had a Christmas tree. And you know how much that Christmas tree in the mall cost? Only $10 million, alhamdulillah. Only $10 million, it wasn't much. When, the, our, when our sisters in Palestine do not have clear water to drink, our sisters in Ethiopia, in Afghanistan, in Somalia, 
they have no clear water to drink but at the same time these people are willing to spend 10 million dollars for a Christmas tree imagine that a Christmas tree and alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah we have the neighboring city who decided and say we have to outdo them and by next year, inshallah, they will only come up with a tree that will cost them $20 million. Listen, how hard they try to follow the footsteps of the people before us. So if you want the change, first step of change is be independent. Be yourself. Do not follow anyone's, uh, anyone else's footsteps. Choose Al-Islam, which is the second point, which is have self-respect and have dignity in Al-Islam. Dignity. One of the Sahaba of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was captured by the enemies of Al-Islam. And this is Abdullah ibn Hudayr. He was captured by the enemies of an Islam. And then the enemy of Islam said, We want to know about these people. Why are they so strong, so believe, they have strong belief in their religion? Why can't they be like us? So they said, the ruler said, I want to see one of them. So they brought Abdullah ibn Hudayr. Abdullah ibn Hudhaf is a Sahabi and it's not a great Sahabi like Abu Bakr and Ali and Uthman but he is a great Sahabi to us but it's not as that can though we respect them all so the ruler said to him how about if you accept Christianity and I will set you free Abdullah ibn Hudhafa said, Wala bi tarfati ayin. Not for a second. Not for a fraction of a second. And then the king said, or the ruler said, How about if I give you half of my kingdom? He wants to test this man. He wants to say if this man really is after worldly gain or he has izz in al Islam. He has an Izz in an Islam. Not even the world, the, the kingdom of your father. Then the king said, Ruddu, send him back to the cell. I know how to change and I know how to bend his willpower. So they kept away drink and food for three days. <coughs> They accept khanzir and wine. Khanzir and wine. And after the third day, he would not eat. So they report back and they said, the companion of Muhammad refused to eat the khanzir and drink from the wine. So they call him back. And they say, why don't you eat? Let he will die. He said, Wallahi, my religion allowed me to eat khanzir and alcohol, drink alcohol at the time of necessity. But because I know what you're trying to establish, I refuse to touch anything that is prohibited in Islam. So they said, send him back. So they sent him back. And they brought this, the most beautiful women that they could find. And she came with that seducive outfit. And she started dancing around him. And Abdullah ibn Hudhaba not paying attention to this lady. And then he came and the lady said to the guards, اخرجوني من عندي فوالله لا يدري فوالله لا أدري هو رجل أم حجر she said, take me out of this place for Allah, I don't know whether this is a human being, this is a man or a rock. 
Now imagine, ya ikhwati fillah, a man who's away from his wife in a strange country, a prisoner, and he refused to touch this lady because for the feet of Allah and for the honor that he had for the Islam. Finally, the man said, at targhib did not work. Let us use targhib. Let us stir them. So they brought this boiling oil. And they brought some of the companions, some of the Muslim prisoners. And they took them and dipped them in that boiling oil. And then Abdullah ibn Hudhafa, when he saw that condition, the king said, Accept my offer or you will die. And Abdullah ibn Hudhafa said, Never. So the king said, Go and dip him in the oil. In his way, when he was leaving the palace, he cried. So the soldiers rushed back to the king and report, and they said, That Muslim cried. Perhaps now we cracked in and we get it into him. So the king said, bring him back. So they brought Abdullah ibn Hadafa back. <coughs> he said, no, would you accept my offer? He said, never. He said, then why did you cry? He said, because I realized I only have one soul. And I wish that I had 1,000 souls so you can kill them all for the sake of Islam. For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the king said, I will release you. But under one condition, he said, what is it? He said, kiss my forehead. He said, your forehead is impure, najis, and I would never kiss a face or a forehead of a najis. The king said, I will let you go and some of the Muslim prisoners. Abdullah ibn Hudhafa said, no, if I kiss your head, then you will let all the Muslim prisoners go. The king thought about it and he agreed to it. He agreed to it. Abdullah ibn Hudhafa, with the rest of the prisoners, they walked to Umar ibn Khattab in Medina. And Abdullah ibn Hudhafa, he is so ashamed of what he did, kissed the head of the enemy. And then Umar ibn Khattab said, what did you do that you felt so disgraced? He said, I disgraced an Islam and I kissed the head of an enemy of an Islam. And he said, for what price? He said, for the price for all these Muslims to be sent free. Umar ibn Khattab said, حق على كل مسلم أن يقبل رأس عبد الله بن حذاف. He said, now it's half for every Muslim, the wajib of every Muslim, that they must kiss the head of Abdullah ibn Hudaf. Abdullah ibn Hudaf. What made him do this is because, what made him do this is because of the izzat nafs that he had for Islam. It's the self-respect that he had for Islam. Now, the second thing, as I said, that you need to do is to have that izzat in nafs for an Islam. أقول ما تسمعون استغفر الله فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على رسوله المصطفى سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. نوّيه في الله. Let us say, and let us observe, let us see how we can change our present, our present time or condition. You're living, we're all living in the West. We're living in a society where the people are so friendly most of the time. We're living in a society that people would not care what you do as long as you're not disturbing them and as long as you're not getting into their space. Yet, 
We're not doing anything to change them, nor we are allowing them to change us. Why? Because we send our children to their schools. We watch their media. We listen to their information and news. We read for them. So there is no way that you can, they, when you will not be affected by the lifestyle that we're living in. Now how can we turn that around and change it and make it better for ourselves? First thing that we all should do is to see our ability and capacity as an individuals. Ask yourself today, what can you do for Islam? If the only thing that you can do is say hi to your neighbors and give them a gift, then do it. If you can come out and write about Islam, the correct Islam, not a radical, uh, radical Islam or, you know, uh, what do you call it, liberal Islam, none of that. وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا The middle court, always. Not this far, not this side, and nor, nor this side. Always in the, on the middle path. Now if you can write something about Islam to present the beauty of Islam, do so. If you can help and teach new Muslim how to pray, do so. If you cannot do any of that, but you can sponsor with your pound, with your money, some da'wah activity, then do it. The point is here, ikhwati fillah. Since you're here, you can do something for this deen. Yes, in a different level, but we can all do. All do. There was this Jamaican brother. He passed away, Allah yarham. And he was middle, in middle school. And this young boy, you know, with his rasta hair and all this. In school, he was, he was one of the worst students. Because he would never attend any of the classes. As a matter of fact, he used to sell drugs in school. And subhanAllah, somehow he got to know about Islam. So he became a Muslim. Now keep in mind this young boy is known through the, throughout school that he's a drug dealer, he's up to no good. The parents will say to their children when they, before they go to school, stay away from that Jamaican kid. You know, they, he was out there. And when he became a Muslim and Allah had guided him, he asked himself the question, what can I do for Islam? So what did he do? He said, I know all these guys. I used to supply them with drugs for these guys. He used to facilitate for them. So he came to them and he said, listen, you better read about Islam. You know, Genghis says time. If you don't read about Islam, I'm gonna hurt you. This is how he knows about Islam. Because when he was in that lifestyle, if you don't buy my stuff, then something would happen to you. So now read about Islam. So the principal got to know that this kid became a Muslim and now he's no longer doing the drugs, which is good news, but he's presenting, propagating in Islam. So the principal said, you cannot do this in public school. So Bilal said, I used to sell drugs. That means I can sell anything that I want. And I will sell the da'wah of Islam in my school. So he will come and say, Psst, boy, come. And the boy would come, expect that he would give him a drug or sell him a drug and he would give him a pamphlet about Islam. Read this. And he would walk away as though he just gave him a drug. And then kids in the school became Muslim. Wallahi, I walked into a masjid and I saw a big, large halaqa and I said, Bilal, what are you doing? How long have you been Muslim? He said, two months. I said, what are these guys? 
He said, that side are the old Muslims. But this side are the new Muslims. So what did he do? He's a gangster. He has, you know, ways of, you know, threatening these kids. He said, you were born into Islam from a Muslim family. You better put your act together or I will hurt you. So those old Muslims who would not pray, would not do anything, they became religious for a fear of Bilal. They feared him, so they said, we're going to pray, otherwise Bilal is going to hurt us after school. So they come, and what is he teaching them? Wallah, he was teaching them how to recite, Qul Wallahu Ahad. And they were born Muslim kids. Qul Wallahu These are the kids who used to sell drugs to them. Qul Wallahu Ahad. And then these kids are the kids that he gave them shahada, and now he has his own little crew. And he made them all daddies. As he used to make the rest of them gangsters, he made them daddies. I said, why did you do this? He said, because when Abu Bakr accepted Islam, he said to the messenger of Allah, what is my responsibility? And the messenger of Allah said to Abu Bakr, my, your responsibility is my responsibility. And my responsibility is yours, which means to convey the message of Islam. And then Abu Bakr went and he brought six from the Ashara Mubashirin Bil Jannah. Six out of the ten. Now, with that mentality, if that little boy, a gangster, drug dealer, after he became a Muslim, was able to change the lives of those Mus old Muslims and give that word to new Muslims, what can you and I do for this deen? We can do a lot. Whatever you do, you can do something. So Allah would not change the condition of these people that we are part of them unless we change our condition and unless we become more concerned about the da'wah and cease and say to ourselves, SubhanAllah, look how Indonesian Muslim community and Malaysian, how do they accept Islam? Not through jihad, not through war, not through anything, just through simple calm da'wah. So you can do exactly the same thing the Ibn subhanahu wa ta'ala. Three things. One, do not rely on anyone else other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Two, feel the izz of Islam in your heart. Three, ask yourself, what can I do for Islam? These, these are three points that you need to walk away from this khutbah. And do not just listen to the khutbah as for the sake of khutbah. Listen to the khutbah and see if we, what you can do, inshallah, in your real life. How many Muslim, non Muslim can you bring to the Islam? How many unguided Muslim or misguided Muslims can you bring them back to this deen? And whether you can do this or not, it all depends on your willpower. اللهم عز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم عز الإسلام والمسلمين رب المصلاة الحمد لله